Uh, welcome back. This is uh, AP English, and we are back again with the uh, Chaucer lectures. This is uh, the continuation of our observations on Chaucer. I want to go to the end of the general prologue. I want to make some observations about Chaucer's awareness that the project he's working with is going to be very controversial, no doubt about it. It's going to be an extremely controversial project. And then we'll get into the first of the two tales that we will be studying, the Pardoner's Prologue Tale. Chaucer has got to be able to stand behind some kind of voice or personae that allows him to not take directly the heat of the kind of writing that he will be doing. The easiest way to do that is to make up a story where he is going to describe an event that happened this journey to Canterbury. But before he gets to the end of his general prologue, he's got some, he's got to cover his can because he realizes he's about to take some serious heat, not only for things he's already said, for example, about the friar and as we'll get into it, this partner and his pal, the Sumner, in a moment, but also some things that are inevitably coming. By the way, when you go to a film, before the movie gets started, they show these things called trailers. Now, what are those trailers and what are they designed to do? So, for example, you're watching the film, but before the film starts, in most theaters anyway, they will show a series of brief, short exhibitions of films soon to appear, right? Well, jot down in your notes, what's the primary role of those trailers. By the way, in the construction of a film, this is one of the monumental costs. Huge amounts of money go into creating these real brief two, three, four minute trailers. Why? What is it that that project does? Sherman, what is it that it does? Get you excited for like another film. It does. It sets you up, right? Now, all of us have been fooled by a really good trailer, right? Where, for example, you watch the trailer, you're like, dude, this is gonna be the bestest film of all time. And then once you watch the film, you go, basically they took all the great parts of the film and stuck it in a three minute trailer, and that's the entire film, right? Notice that the trailer will gesture towards what's going on in the film, but it's not gonna tell you the full story. It simply is going to heighten your interest in viewing the text. Let's go ahead and say it now this way. The general prologue is the trailer for the Canterbury Tales, okay? The general prologue, the job of the general prologue is in large measure to set up the stories that will be told. In other words, just enough will be shared that we will call, and this is important for your notes, character sketches. Chaucer in many ways invents the character sketch where he will describe a character he will tell us about the friar. The understanding is this friar is ultimately going to tell a story later. It will be called the friar's tale. Okay? And, and, and it allows us to get some sense of who this person is going to be telling the story so that ultimately when the story, it's time for the story to get told, we're going to be excited to want to read about whatever it is that he says. Before Chaucer gets into that project, though, he pauses for a moment, and I think we were, we were finishing here yesterday, so I'll come back to it. I'm on page 159, and roughly uh, lines uh, uh, 7, what is it, 745 or so. Notice he says, but first, before I get into this, he says, but first I beg of you in courtesy not to condemn me as unmannerly, if I speak plainly and with no concealings, right, and give account of all their words and dealings, using their very phrases as they fell, for certainly, as you all know so well, he who repeats a tale after a man is bound to say as nearly as he can, each single word, if he remembers it, however rudely spoken or unfit, or else the tale he tells will be untrue, the things pretended in the phrases New. In other words, he says, I don't have a choice to offend. Uh, I'll, give you a, I'll give you an example of this. My Ash, my oldest daughter, she came home one afternoon from the East Side Playground and she told about the bad, bad boy that used the bad, bad word. And then she got to say the bad, bad word, to which her mother said, 
We don't use that word in this house. And she said, I didn't use the word. So-and-so, the bad, bad boy, used the word. And she got to use the word a second time, to which mom said, Ashley Ray, we don't use that. I am telling you the story. This is what the bad, bad boy said third time. She gets to use the word. See, notice my ash. She's not using the word. She's reporting somebody else using the word. This is exactly what Chaucer is saying. He says, I'm going to use a lot of bad, bad words. And he does. I'm not just talking about bad, bad language. I'm talking about to call a friar, a holy priest, a slut is not a good idea in 1350. You're clearly going to upset a whole lot of people. Hello, you still upset people today if they know what wanton when in Mary means. Okay, uh, Chaucer's audience definitely understood what he was saying. Uh, and so he begins by saying, look, I don't mean to offend, but I have to tell the truth. I can't be held a liar. I have to report exactly what it is that they said, and to do that, I'm clearly going to give offense. <coughs> Please forgive me. Then Chaucer will use three reasons why he needs to tell, quote unquote, tell the truth. Now, what's darkly ironic about this? The, the entire project is, of course, a lie. It's all made up. It's fiction, right? Notice what he says. <clears throat> For certainly, line 750, for certainly as you all know so well, he who repeats a tale after a man is bound to say as nearly as he can each single word as he remembers it, however rudely spoken or unfit. Or else the tale he tells will be untrue, the things pretended and the phrase is new. He may not flinch, although it were his brother, he may as well say one word as another. And now he gives three reasons why he has to tell the truth. Look at the first one. And Christ himself spoke broad in Holy Writ. Yet there is no scurrility in it. In other words, he says, hey, you always got to tell the truth because that's what Jesus Christ said. And Jesus Christ always told the truth. Now I'm at the top of page 160. And Plato says, notice his parenthetic, for those with power to read, the word should be his cousin to the deed. So he says, first, Jesus Christ said you have to always tell the truth. Secondly, he said, for those with power to read. What does that mean for those with power to read? Because what's ironic is that we're reading Canterbury Tales. To be any reader of this text would be those with power to read, at least on some level. What does he mean when he says, and Plato says, for those with power to read? Now see, here, here's the beautiful thing of having studied Plato. You're already beginning to get a sense of what it is he's really saying. And going forward, you will be able to do the same thing. Once you know Plato's Republic, you can use Plato's Republic in mixed company and then watch people squirm to either admit they don't know what you're talking about or they pretend like they do. For example, it's an interesting observation that you're making to me about the most recent election. It reminds me of what Thrasymachus argues at the end of Republic One, And then you pause. Now what is an individual going to do on the other side of that conversation? Well, they only have one or two options. Throw, 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 throw what? What did you throw at me? What did you just? <laughs> of course, to do that means immediately you know something they don't know. You're playing intellectual power games here, linguistic power games, right? Of course, there's another option, and that is, oh, yes, yes, Thrasymachus, Thrasymachus, oh, oh, Plato, right, Repu and immediately as well, what do you know? Notice the elitism that Chaucer's playing here. There's only a small strata of people who have any sense about Plato and Plato's Republic. Those people will back me up when they say, you always have to tell the truth. Watch how this, watch how this works if you know your Plato. But what sits at the heart of Plato's Republic in regards to the Phoenician myth of the metals? It is a fundamental lie. Remember, we're going to tell everyone within the ideal republic, no, 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 you were born to be a cobbler or you were born to be a soldier because you have special blood in your metal in your veins and it's, a, and it's the gods doing. We're making it up. It's entirely made up. Several of you wrote papers on how unfortunate it is that Plato wants to be the originator of the idea of truth and honesty in government and the way he does it is by lying. Of course, there's a certain intellectual hyperbole at play, no doubt. Notice here, Plato says we've always got to tell the truth. The word should be his cousin to the deed. But finally, if that's not good enough for you, if Jesus Christ and Plato aren't good enough for you, and by the way, notice how you're working with two interesting demographics there. Christ, of course, the religious. Plato, of course, the non-religious, but intellectuals, right? Okay, so he's playing an interesting game here. The last one, further I beg of you to forgive it me, 
If I neglect the order and degree and what is due to rank and what I've planned, I'm sure to whip, <coughs> as you will understand. Put in your book, what is it that he has just said I'm for stupid. his third? I'm what? I'm stupid. I'm stupid. Please forgive me, I'm just an idiot. Well, now, wait a minute. This is just pure Socrates. Socrates is the brilliant originator of the idea, I'm going to pretend like I'm really stupid to make you that think you're so smart feel, look, really stupid. By the way, this is why Miletus and all those guys brought him to trial. Those guys were intellectual sophists, and they did not like the way that Socrates would kind of act like he was really dumb. But then he could notice in the story of Glaucon, well, oh, the myth of Gyges, no, no, go ahead and tell me about that. I don't know that. Right, like Socrates doesn't know the myth of Gyges story. The attention is to set them up and to make them look idiots. Notice what Chaucer does here. I'm just kind of a fool. I'm really stupid. So just please forgive me because I don't know what I'm doing. Well, one thing we absolutely are certain of, and this is part of the paper we're writing, is that Chaucer is in brilliant control of what he's doing. He knows exactly what he's doing. What is he doing? Well, let's write it in our notes. What is he doing? What is Chaucer's agenda? What is Chaucer's project? Well, the best way to answer that question is to look at a single text of Chaucer's. Okay. Now, the problem with a high school anthology is that most of Chaucer's stories, quite frankly, you can't put in a high school anthology. Okay? I mean, one of the more gentle ones tells the story of a gentleman who's married who knows his wife is hanky-panking around, back to what it is the church fathers are always saying about these guys. To catch this, uh, you know, illicit affair, he pretends like he's going away to London. She pretends like she's sad. Oh, you got to go to London again? I don't like it when you go. I'm so alone, he says under his breath. Yeah, right. We're going to find out just how alone you are. And he, under cover of night, comes back. He screams up to her house. And this is interesting for Mr. Batson, who's interested in kind of knowing more about these people. Come to find out, most of them live in houses that are built up on stilts. So the only way you can actually get into the house is to take a ladder and prop it up, climb up the ladder and go in through basically like a window. And then you pull the ladder up. does two things. It protects you from theft, right? Because you have, I mean, you gotta go through a major ordeal just to get up into the house. And when you have these floods that happen, where they kind of flash through, you're sitting up off of the floor and it allows them for your property to be protected. So anyway, he comes to the uh, under cover of night. I'm, I'm back, honey, I decided to not go to, oh, oh, I, okay, I'm so excited you're home. No, you're not, you're up there with a man. I know it and I'm here to catch you. <gasps> How dare you, she says. I can't believe that you would suggest something like that. Uh, you better apologize. And he says, put down the ladder and I'll come up and apologize. And she says, yes, you will. And so up he comes on the ladder. She won't let him in the window. She says, you are not getting in the window until you apologize and give me a kiss. And he's like, all right, fine. I thought you were messing around on me. Still have to kiss me. And he's like, okay, all right, all right. So he kisses and notices that she's grown a, a, a remarkable amount of hair on her face. And then there's a loud fart right into his face. And then there's the laughter of a man, the man whose buttocks he just kissed <laughs> as, he, as he then as well enjoyed the flatulence that was spread right to his nostrils. This is one of the more, this is one of the more like a little close to the edge but not over the edge stories of Chaucer. There's a whole lot more that go way beyond the line than that that never make it into a high school anthology. If you want, you can read them on your own. This is one of those things where you laugh, as Miss Barty does, because it's funny, but it's like, really? This is going to constitute as one of the classic works of literature, eighth grade fart jokes and all of that. You see, some of us like eighth grade fart jokes. We won't get into it, right, Shrub? So here we go. Now let's talk about the partner's tale. And I want to begin by saying something for your notes about the dramatic quality of this text. So you want to write that down now in your notes. The dramatic quality of the text. Now, of course, we have a dramatic presentation that's about to occur this evening at Worland High School by some of our brilliant young actors and actresses. We'll talk about what we mean when we use the word drama. We don't mean drama as in drama, drama, drama. We don't mean like that, okay? When we're using the word drama here and dramatic quality, what we mean is the following. Chaucer wants you to imagine 
and this is important you understand this, or reading this stuff is, uh, most of the joy of reading this is gone. Chaucer wants you to imagine that you have an entourage or a group of travelers traveling from London to Canterbury and then back. They travel for a while, then they get kind of tired, they need a drink, so they all pull over to the side of the road as a group, they break out the brewskis and have a few drinks. We're going to see that that's clearly what goes on, especially in the partner's uh, prologue and tale. And then, after a little bit of drinking, refreshment, one individual will stand up in front of the group and will introduce himself or herself. This is how any intelligent reader of this of this um, Canterbury Tales would recognize Chaucer's constructing all of this. If they were an entourage that knew each other, that is to say the way it's kind of set up, there wouldn't be any need for each one of them to stand up and introduce himself or herself. Got me? So for example, when the wife of Bath stands up in her famous prologue and says, I am from Bath, I've been married five times, all of my husbands have died. I can tell you one thing about marriage. It is a misery and a woe. Marriage sucks. I know. I've been married five times. She says, I'm so excited to find my sixth husband. I hope I find him on this trip. <laughs> Note the irony. It's a dark irony. And her reason is simple. She says, I love to hanky-panky, and you're supposed to hanky-panky and be married. So I'm always welcoming my sixth husband. Oh, yeah, what happened to the other five? Are you interested? And then she goes on for 20 minutes and tells about how she totally destroyed her husbands. Completely destroyed them. And, and she gives the insight about how to do that kind of thing. She says, we women are really good at this. We're so good at lying and swearing. We're so good at turning the argument around the other way so that the gentleman comes out of Worland High School and finds his lovely girlfriend whispering into the ear of another boy. He gets into the truck with her and says, whoa, 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 what was that all about? She says, what was what about? That, I just saw. I walked out the front of the building. I know it. I can know. My eyes can see. She says, you think I'm messing? Oh, that's it. I thought this relationship was built on trust. That is it. I am done with this relationship. And all of a sudden, the guy who has done absolutely nothing, the guy's, oh, no, no, don't, no, don't. No, I am done with this relationship. I thought we, I thought we had something here, and I thought this was built on trust. And, uh, and the guy, hello, the guy is apologizing for doing nothing. And the girl, of course, is smiling all the way. <sighs> and Chaucer's wife, Abath, says, it was so beautiful. That's how I undid so many of my husbands. It was great. <laughs> so for example, I knew my man was hanky-pankying on me at night. I could have gotten upset about it and said something to him, but I decided to build him a cross of the same wood. I come walking out in the evening in a slinky dress, and he goes, whoa, 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 where are you going dressed like that? She says, I am going out with my friends to the bar, and you're not coming along, and you can't tell me what to do. He's like, you ain't doing none of the kind. You're going back in that room, and you're getting yourself dressed in some clothes. She says, I am gone. Wham! She slams the door. He runs after her, but she's smart and already knows how to take three turns and beat him. He doesn't know where she is. He goes out looking for her with his bat. Remember, during Chaucer's day, it was called the rule of thumb. In every room, you're allowed one stick. It cannot be larger than the circumference of your thumb. And it's built so that you can, it's there, so that you can discipline your wife. There are no evidences of men going to jail for beating their wives to death. There are several instances of men going to jail for not beating their wives, for not using the stick. That is to say, if a man stops using the stick, other men would maybe get the same idea. And after a while, we got chaos and anarchy at play. Chaucer, of course, writing during this time with the wife of Bath, and she says, oh, it was beautiful. I went off, I had the best time all night long. I come home about four in the morning, and he's sitting there seething, seething. He's just ready to smack me good. And I come walking through the door after having all of my fun with my girlfriends, and I come walking through the door, and I look at him, and I go, oh, you're, thank goodness you're here. He's already up, ready to smack me, and he's caught. What do you mean I'm here? Of course I'm here. Oh, well, here's the thing. After I left, 
I felt really, really bad about the way I talked to you and dressed in this slinky outfit. And so I decided I needed to come back to apologize. And I came back to the house and you weren't here. Did you go to the bars and sleep around on me? He's like, he's ready. And then he's like, well, no, I was looking for you. I, I, you were not. You were out messing around with other women at the bars. I know that's what, no, no, I wasn't. I was looking for you because I thought you were out messing around. You thought I was messing around at the bar? Oh, I, now I see where this marriage is based on. All of a sudden, the guy's apologizing again. No, 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 I, I, was, I don't believe. That's the wife of fact. After she introduces herself, then she's ready to tell her story. Got me? So there's two parts to this dramatic dance. One, what is said before the story to the story itself. Now we're going to look at the brilliant way in which Chaucer will attack sacred institutions. To that degree, he is an iconoclast. Now let's use that term again because we're familiar with it. Icon, sacred relics. If you are iconoclastic, you are iconoblastic. That is to say you pick up the large aluminum bat, you find the most sacred things and you just smash them. Okay? You go after <laughs> sacred ideas, sacred institutions, sacred cows, and you basically attack them. That's iconoclastic. Chaucer is going to be an iconoclast in the two stories we will study. First, in the partner's tale, prologue and tale, he will be looking at the church. And Chaucer will be one of our early reformers of the church. The second will be one I've already mentioned, the wife of Bath. Chaucer's going to go after the whole institution of marriage and gender wars as we come to think of it later. We will see Chaucer as a remarkable early feminist. It is an amazing thing what he will do in his text. Uh, and as we get into our discussions of the wife of Bath, we will be blown away by how the arguments he presents through the mouthpiece of the wife of Bath, even today, can still create problems. So much so that years ago in my room when I had tables, we were into the middle of a discussion of the wife of Bath's prologue, and all of a sudden, a gentleman sla uh, gets slapped by a girl. I mean hard, as in slapped, as in I thought at first it was a punch. It made so much noise. Whack! Um, that's bad enough, but let me tell you that we were just a few weeks away from graduating, and those two were engaged to be married upon graduation. They had been dating for some three years already, and the expectation was upon graduation that everyone in the room would be attending their happy marriage. She slapped him. Uh, it, it, yeah, they ended up not marrying. Um, but uh, but the, the, the reason that she slapped him was a comment that he made. The comment that he made was in direct reference to simply my reading of a few lines from the wife of Bath's prologue where she makes an observation about married people and money and who it is that should be given the right to the credit card. In other words, she asks, which kind of man does a woman want? The kind of man that says, no, you ain't going to Billings. You don't need to be going to Billings wasting our money. Or does, do women want the husband that says, you need to go to Billings and just shop, shop, shop. Here's the credit card so you can go have fun. <laughs> to which the gentleman made a quick observation about giving the credit card to his wife so she could go to Billings and just shop, shop, shop. His comment was said somewhat under his breath, but it was loud enough for the whole class to hear him say, hail, no. To which, <laughs> apparently, they had not yet had the conversation about who's in charge of the credit card. That conversation apparently happened later. We'll get to the life of Bath. It inevitably leads to a certain amount of, how does one say it politely, discussion. But before we get there, let's talk about the partner, shall we? Who is this partner? Well, let's jump back into our general prologue for a moment at page 158. And we're told, man, the satire is just going to drip off these lines as, as Chaucer writes about this partner. Take a look at it, 158. <clears throat> 
We're going to be told about we're going to be told about a uh, about a Sumner uh, and a partner. Now let's start actually on 157 with the Sumner. Now for your notes, the Sumner and the partner travel together. The Sumner is a religious bounty hunter. All right. There was a Sumner with us at that inn, his face on fire like cherubim, for he had carbuncles. He has huge white zits all over his face. I'm on page 157, by the way. Huge white zits all over his face. Carbuncles. His eyes were narrow. He was hot and lecherous as a sparrow. We're back to calling religious people sluts again. Uh, he has these gross zits all over his face, but he hanky-pankies with everything. The Sumner is a religious priest. He's a bounty hunter who goes out to find the lost and try to bring them to salvation. Uh, notice he can, Chaucer continues, black scabby brows he had and a thin beard. Children were afraid when he appeared. No quicksilver, lead ointment, tartar creams, no brimstone, no borax, so it seems, could make a salve that had the power to bite or clean up or cure his whelks of knobby white or purge the pimples sitting on his cheeks. <laughs> Garlic he loves and onions too. He likes to get drunk and <laughs> sing songs as he runs, drives through town. Uh, I, I know you've already read this, but we'll point out the Sumner likes to go find some poor young guy who is maybe having a bit of fun with his girlfriend and he breaks through the door and says gotcha you are caught and you are about to get busted by my friend the partner uh, unless you have a little bit of dough a little bit of currency uh, if you have currency then we'll forgive you we can take care the kid, of course, is so horrified by getting caught that he'll pay any amount of money to get off the hook. And the Sumner then says, come on, I'll take you to my friend. He takes care of everything. And that friend is the partner. I'm on the next page, 158. He, notice the, the irony, and a gentle partner, we're going to find out this partner is anything but gentle, and a gentle partner rode together, a bird from Charing Cross of the same feather. What does that mean? Birds of a feather flock together, of course, comes from these lines. That is to say, the Sumner and the partner, they work together. They are religious, but they are deviant criminals. That is to say, they know how to use the system. Just back from the court of King of Rome, he loudly sang, come hither, love, come home. In other words, as he comes into town, he starts singing songs so the barmaids can hear him and know that he's arrived. He will say in his own prologue that he enjoys going to new towns so that he can how does he say it? Try the local fair. Let's now get to the partner's <laughs> prologue. And uh, yeah, the churchman, yeah. Now, by the way, this is not the friar that we met earlier who he called a slut. That's a different guy. And the friar and the partner themselves are not going to get on so very well. For example, you're re reminding you, you're going to have the partner standing in front of the entourage. And this is what I meant by that dramatic uh, element. And you got to kind of imagine in your mind's eye, there's Chaucer, there's everybody else, the wife of Bath, the good par you know, the, the good parson, all of them. And all of a sudden, the partner will step up and will introduce himself. Now, that introduction we will call his prologue. Okay? So for each one of the tales, Chaucer will create a little prologue, a little introduction. Sometimes that prologue is much longer than the story. The wife of Bath's prologue, if I were to read it out loud to you, and I may because it's always so much fun to do it, uh, it runs for about 25, almost 30 minutes. The story takes about 12 minutes to hear out loud. Chaucer's far more interested in telling us about the wife of Bath than about her famous story, okay? The, the, uh, the partner's prologue then begins. Now, I want to point out something. Your book, your editors have to be somewhat careful here. There are certain parts of this they just frankly have to edit out, okay? And so you'll kind of get a sense of this when um, there's, there's these uh, ellipses that happen. That means he's about to go on a little bit longer, and your textbook company, for fear, I think, of maybe upsetting readers, uh, will excise certain amounts of the prologue here. We can take a look at it real quickly. By the way, it's fairly evident that the partner begins 
with a beer in his hand and finishes with three bottles on the ground, if you get my drift. By the time he finishes his prologue, he will say it out loud. His tongue has become a little bit loose because he's a little bit drunk. And so now he's going to say what he really thinks. And in that process, you can imagine that the Sumner is kind of sitting there doing one of these to him. Dude, would you just shut up? Well, you know, because the Sumner are in here together to make money. Like, you're giving everything away. And you can kind of imagine the parson. Remember what we said? First, he wrought. Remember what we said? And afterwards, what did we say? He taught. Remember that? Remember those lines? That is to say, remember, the parson is for Chaucer, a good, a good churchman. He obviously is going to hear what the partner has to say and go, see, this is what's wrong with the church. You've got people like this. It ruins that blah, blah, blah. Let's take a look. My lords, the parson, uh, the, uh, the partner. My lords, he said, I'm on page 166. My lords, he said, in churches where I preach, I cultivate a haughty kind of speech and ring it out as loudly as a bell. I've got it all by heart, the tale I tell. I have a text that always is the same and always has been since I learned. Look what he calls preaching. The game. The game. He, likes, he likes the game. What is the game? Well, he says, I have one text. The love of money is the root of all evil. He says, I love this text because it frees the pelt. Now, here again, Mr. Batson will learn something about these English people of 1350. Hey, guys, in 1350, there are no banks. All money is in coinage, no paper money, and there are no banks. So the question, obviously, is how do you protect your money? Two things. One, you can have a little safe called a coffer that will have only one key, never two. So the obvious question is in the family, who gets to have the key on a rope or chain around his or her neck? The wife of bats will be the one who argues, well, everyone knows who it should be. It should be the woman who has the key, to which, of course, her husbands were like, absolutely not, to which she says it this way. Well, think about it this way. Which one of us is the smartest? And he says, I'm a man, I'm smarter. And she says, right, you are smarter, which means you have more patience. Would you agree? And he goes, yeah. And if you have more patience, then you can put up with all of the mistakes that I make. I, on the other hand, am dumb. That means I have no patience, and I can't put up with mistakes so easily. So since you are smarter than me and have more patience, you can put up with mistakes easier. I should be the one that has the key. I can then make mistakes, and you can put up with that much easier. Hand over the key. <laughs> Unless, of course, you want to argue that you should have the key because I'm the smarter one and therefore have more patience and you can screw it up. So, hand over the key. Unless you want to argue I'm the smarter one with more patience. And then you can have the key. And he goes, but I'm the smarter one. I totally agree. Why don't you hand the key over to me? So I can <laughs> screw it up. She goes, that was easy. He handed the key over every time. Brutal. Now, what we will figure out, along with the coffer, what we'll figure out is that the pelf was the way men carried their money. It was a cloth that you laid on the floor, you put your coinage down the middle, you then folded it back and forth, and then you wrapped it around yourself several times as a belt. It held up your trousers, but it also carried your money. That way your money was safe. He says, the partner, I love to preach from this text because it frees the pelf. That is to say, they take out their money and they begin to give me their money, which he says is the number one reason. Well, we'll let him tell it. <laughs> I preach as you have heard me say before and tell a hundred lying mockeries more. I take great pains in stretching out my neck to east and west. I crane about and peck just like a pigeon sitting on a barn. My hands and tongue together spin the yarn, and all my antics are a joy to see. The curse of avarice and cupidity is all my sermon, for it frees the pelf. Out come the pence, and especially for myself. For my exclusive purpose is to win, and not at all to castigate their sin. Once dead, what matter how their souls may fare? They can go blackberrying for all I care. Whoa, 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 did you see what you just read? That is to say, he says, I really don't care about their, about their souls. Once they, got, they die, they can go to hell and pick blackberries for all I care. I'm interested in their money. That's why I preach. I want their money. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What is Chaucer doing? And let's analyze more closely the brilliance of what he's doing. It's like this. Can you imagine for a moment 
that you have tremendous respect for a certain adult. But then someone shows you a video clip that's being made of that adult speaking, and that individual doesn't know that he or she is being videotaped. Where that, where that adult says about you, man, she or he is the stupidest person. I can't believe us. They're so unbelievably naive and stupid. I can get away with anything. And you're watching this video. The next time you see that person, and that person starts speaking so nice to you, 